she was imprinted she was a needy beast like nightmare status we left her alone for 30 seconds and she would be chirping and pacing back and forth and biting her feet and rolling her head and all sorts of crazy things and we thought what would an eight-week-old otter be doing right now is this normal is this not normal what can we do to help and we really decided that an eight-week-old otter if mom got out of sight would chirp until mom came back and then crisis averted were reunited and everything would be okay. So we decided instead of going with the cry it out method, we would actually cater to this needy beast. So we uh, had 24 hour care. I'm gonna play a little video here that's kind of fun. Um, we gave her 24 hour care. There we go. All right, so this is what a morning with Olive looked like after she came in to work from being at my house overnight. Uh, we would greet anyone who showed up for work in the morning at the front of the building, and then we walked back to a little room um, where she spent most of her day. We learned we needed to keep her really busy, like really busy, always doing something different, like every 30 minutes. We did a ton of training sessions, at least six, and sometimes upwards of eight to 10 per day. Uh, and that is how we kind of kept our little toddler really busy. And there's just a really cute picture of her face that we have to wait to get to here. Right there. Ugh, okay, first Nelson. Alright. Oh, not again. It was cute, but not that cute. Okay, but she was a toddler. Anybody in the room a parent or know a two year old? Okay, so two year olds and animals go through this terrible twos stage, right? It's where both toddlers and animals realize that they have their own goals, dreams, desires, or just wants and needs. And we as either keepers or parents are inhibiting them from meeting those needs. And uh, so the result is exactly what Diana just talked about. If we're missing those cues, we've got frustration and aggression. But I just used those label things, right? We're not supposed to do that. Uh, that way we can, so that we can talk, make sure we're all talking about the same thing. Let's operationalize that a little bit. So what was in our frustration box? Well, for Olive, frustration looked like leaving session, going to swim, playing with her food, changing her body position so she wasn't in the right position for a behavior. Um, it might just be lackluster performance, slow, all of those things. Problem is all of those frustration behaviors also go in the not motivated box, right? So how do we tell the difference between not motivated and frustrated? Well, we had to look at the whole picture of the day. So let's say first thing in the morning, Olive got a protected contact session and it was mostly just basic behaviors, her easy stuff that she knows really, really well. And then we come in at the next session and we're gonna work on a new behavior and she starts exhibiting some of these frustration box uh, behaviors. That's kind of a clear sign to us that it's not about motivation, that it's probably a little bit more about I'm not interested in doing whatever it is that you're asking me to do. Now precursors to aggression are a little bit easier to define, I would say. So these are when she would grab a hold of our boot or our foot or our leg, 
or she nibbled gently, that was cute, um, <laughs> on your hand. Those were some of these precursors. I've got another video for you guys here. I want you to see if you can see the precursor in this video. When it loads. <clears throat> I have a hard time figuring out how to do that. I don't know what I have a hard time figuring out. <laughs> Anybody see it? Uh -huh. That little foot stomp, right? So much sass. If you work with a porcupine or a rabbit, it's very similar, right? It sounds like giraffes do it as well. All right. Now, aggression was a little bit easier, like really clear. But I will never forget, um, I was at Target once and there was this mom and this three-year-old and he was throwing like a fit with all the bells and whistles. Down on the floor, he'd thrown all his stuff, he was screaming, he was kicking his feet. And she leaned down and said something that I put in my future parent notebook because I was like, that is amazing and I wanna use it. She leaned down and she said, if you do not straighten up right now, we are going to engage in hand to butt combat. <laughs> loved it but seriously all of those things that we just talked about are all of saying if you do not get it together we are going to engage in hand to or teeth to trainer combat right so let's see what that looks like so this is Heather um, she is painfully having to watch this in the room um, and she is teaching a spin so great approximation there got three or four good steps gave her some good food she's gonna ask another behavior as a little bit of a break and then she's gonna ask again. Excuse me. And Heather is the coolest, most <laughs> relaxed, calm trainer. The only tell she gave was, what was that about? <laughs> she gives her a great LRS, asks another behavior, sends her into the crate so she can go get some band-aids. <laughs> so that's what it looked like she, when she was done. And no one really wants to get bit like that, right? So best solution, just make this animal a protective contact exhibit animal and be done, right? No. Thank you, yeah. no, that's not what we do. Uh, so we did a lot. Uh, first, we reduced the number of trainers on her and as a result, that kind of increased the cumulative experience level because we took a lot of inexperienced trainers off. We worked to eliminate any end of session predictors. We shifted for a while to only training new behaviors PC because that seemed to be a good place where she got really frustrated. We kept them busy, we gave them novel food, all sorts of things. And if you were at ABMA, you heard all about this. And if you weren't at ABMA, you can email Bree. Just take a picture of that slide and she would love to share her paper with you. Um, she's got like a 10 page paper about everything we did so you can read a lot. All right, and all of those things were nice, but they didn't completely solve the problem. So we still needed another solution. So I had remembered I'd been at Imata and I'd heard Dolphin Quest present about a dolphin named Bob. And Bob was a little bit of a problem. He would aggress on guests during encounters and trainers. And uh, they showed a great picture where there were six dolphins in the air and five of them were super high and Bob was about halfway. He's like, I don't know. I don't, I'm not having it. So they decided that choice might work to be a primary reinforcer. And here's what they believe in case you're not with me yet. So choice, the choice to ensure your own survival is a pretty big deal, right? And primary reinforcers typically satisfy some biological drive. And I would say survival is probably a pretty big biological drive, right? So that's how they kind of <laughs> determined that choice was a primary reinforcer and we agreed. But how do we give these animals choice? Well, this is what we did. We put that uh, little shape that you see in the background in her area during every session. And we usually tried to put it at a place where she typically went when she was done or frustrated. And then if she touched the shape, we, let, we ended the session however we would normally end the session. So if we were in her enclosure, we would drop the food and we would leave. If we were in an encounter, we would send her to her crate, feed her, close the door, and take her back home. So it just kind of depended upon what area we were in, how that would work. And here's what it looked like, eventually. Not 
that you can see the otter that she's in there. Um, and so I was working on some basic behaviors, things were going pretty well, and then what you can see right here is there is a wooden mat down there, like a, a teak shower mat, and all of a sudden it's really interesting. It smells really good, there's like pebbles around, it's really cool. Uh, right when I started working a new behavior. So I get some focus back over here when she realizes, okay, we're not doing that anymore, so maybe I'll pay attention to get some more food. I get some good um, results in the pool there. Except for when I try to cure while she's still eating. Not recommended. I'm going to go back and work on that behavior again, and she says, no, you're not. <laughs> so I put some food down, and we leave. The question is, did it work, right? It worked. <laughs> um, so you're going to see a couple graphs here, hopefully. There we go. So these are those precursors that we talked about. So you'll see there's a pretty big uh, decrease. Yes. There was one time where we were literally off the charts in how many precursors we saw. Next graph is even more scary, <laughs> for my boss at least. Um, so these are cases of actual aggression or bites. So you can see there we had one month where we had over 15, um, maybe not as bad as Heather's, but 15 bites in one month and a, a pretty good reduction there. And then this is the number of times it was actually selected each month. So September is when we introduced it. You can see she chose it 17 times that month. And that's because we didn't actually train it. It was just a shape in the room. So she didn't know what it meant in the beginning. So she tried to figure it out, right? So she'd go over and touch it. And then we'd leave and she'd be like, oh, interesting. And then you kind of would see the next time she'd do the same thing. And then as time went on, she started strategically choosing when she was going to end it. So now we see like either she's really full and she's not incredibly motivated and that's when she chooses it. Or we might see we're working on a new behavior and she's like, no, not having it. Um, I'll be done. And you know, it worked so well for training, we thought why not use it in our introduction. So this is a video of Olive being introduced to one of our males, Emmett, that you saw earlier. And this is what it looked like out on exhibit. If anybody's done otter intros before, it's pretty fun. <laughs> and they neither of them have any idea what they're doing, so it definitely doesn't look like what it's supposed to look like. They'll get it eventually. All right. Here's what it looked like behind the scenes. Now we thought we were going to be, like Olive knows this shape, right? So we thought we were gonna be offering it to her, but this is actually Emmett, and this is the second introduction, and Emmett is in the back. Gotta get the girl off of him. <laughs> and then, yeah, and then he touches the shape, we close that shift door, and he was able to end the sessions. And he actually chose to end almost all of their introductions <laughs> during that time. So, I don't think we'll have any babies coming anytime soon, unfortunately. <laughs> now I'm stealing another Susan Friedman quote here. So behavior is a study of one, and we have our two other ambassador river otters who wouldn't turn down food if they were in the middle of a tornado. So ending a session is not anything that's very encouraging or positive or rewarding for them. So they're not doing any of that. Um, so that's not, it's not applicable for them, but we are really excited to try it with some of our other animals. There's one of our tigers who I think will benefit from this greatly, and I'm really excited to hear if you guys decide to go home and implement this. I want to hear all about it. And then I have to do some thank yous here. So thanks to my team, um, because this shape was never where it was supposed to be. It was always hidden, so you're always looking for this stupid shape every day, every session, six times a day, which can be a real pain in the ass. And then, of course, the cutest otter on the face of the planet. Do you guys have any questions? Exactly. Yep. Are you put in there without it being like the focal point of work? It was. 
So the first time we put it in, I think she did maybe three to four behaviors and then she went and touched it. So it was definitely like, what is this? And then we just didn't weigh out food for that. So there were, it's up to the trainer whether or not they weigh out food if she touches the end of session. And so for that time, we just transferred that food over to another session. So in the beginning, we were really flexible with her. Uh, how, much, or, uh, how did you decide how much food to eat when you left? Um, so that's just what we would normally do, which is basically enough food to keep them busy while we get out the door without them coming out the door with us. So it's usually three to five pieces of food. So we didn't do any more for the end of session than what we would normally do. So how long did you wait between when you ended a session and when you came back to offer another opportunity for reinforcement? So the first few times when we felt like she didn't know what it meant and we were figuring it out, we came back in about an hour. And then after that, once we started seeing, and it was probably four times before she started making some real intentional choices. You could see like, oh, I messed up my cue and she went and chose into a session. Um, and then we would just not come back until our next session time. Did you ever get um, like any sense of when you were right on the schedule for later? Mm -mm. Not, well, not after the end of session choice. Now prior, yes, we yeah. could talk about that a lot. No-ish. I mean, putting the food down in the same way every time when we need to get out the door is pretty telltale. Um, but we tried to really mix that up prior to using the end of session. So we would leave um, enrichment or a new novel type of food, or we would leave and then we'd come right back. So we tried to kind of eliminate those end of session predictors the first time around, but we never used a true end of session like we're all done. How many? How much time do I have? How am I doing? No, nope, she still um, learns, uh, I mean, you know, I have no real good data on that, but yeah. How did you get your management to approve this as opposed to just calling her a protected contact? Um, a crucial conversation, thanks Diana. <laughs> I've also read that book, if you haven't read it, you need to. Um, I had a two page outline like conversation where I said, please don't give us up on us yet. We think we can make this work. Cause yeah, our incidents were incident reports were, um, we didn't report all 17 of those sites, <laughs> um, but our incident reports were kind of getting yeah. out of control. Yeah, so we do all of our own, mostly all of our own husbandry training. So we as trainers do our own uh, injections and vaccines. Um, and she is a real big wuss. So she's just now learning to accept uh, injection. So she hasn't ever had the situation where the vet is there with her and it's a different situation. She has went to go touch the end of session during an injection training session before. But we are still making progress at the same rate as, you know, I think we normally would, other than that she's a real big wuss. <laughs> one more question. Okay, one more, last one. option B we never saw any like hey wait where are you going it was more like or or more than that hey wait where are you going I guess there's a, a tone difference um, but we did see like oh you know it, it was kind of like an interesting and it was almost I mean this is really crazy anthropomorphic but you could almost see empowerment in her, like wait a minute I have control over this you know so but it was never like wait don't leave 